I want to wish everybody a Lag Ba'omer Sameach from ZOA and welcome you to this installment of Zoom with ZOA. I hope you've been able to catch some of our previous programming. There's a lot more to come. As some of you who are on the call earlier heard, Howard alluded to some upcoming programming and he'll tell you about that at the end of the call. Tonight we're privileged to hear from Zev Orenstein, Director of International Affairs at Ir David, the City of David Foundation, and ZOA Deputy Director Howard Katzhoff. Mr. Orenstein's presentation is called The Battle Over Jerusalem's Past, Present, and Future Heritage, A Matter of Fact and Faith. Please remain muted for the duration of the program. It's best to submit questions via the Zoom chat feature. You can also raise your hand using that Zoom chat feature, but we'll be regarding the questions sent via chat as primary. So please, if you can, send your questions by chat. Please also understand that neither ZOA nor Ir David will be able to answer questions of a political nature. So please keep your questions appropriately uh, theme. The ZOA was founded in 1897, and the Zionist Organization of America has been at the forefront of pro-Israel and pro-Jewish advocacy for more than 120 years. Through our Center for Law and Justice, Department of Government Relations, and ZOA campus, in the halls of Congress, in the media, and in your neighborhood, ZOA shares truth and facts that support Israel's right to be and remain a sovereign Jewish state, including Judea and Samaria, with Jerusalem as her undivided capital, and with the right to defend herself if and whenever necessary. Now let's get to the program. It is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce to you not only my colleague and mentor here at ZOA, but also my very dear friend. Howard is a patent attorney by training. He's been in the restaurant business, and he's even been in the kids' furniture business. At a very early age, in the early 1950s, Howard's parents took Howard and his brother out of school, and they traveled to Israel by ship for a three-month odyssey where Howard's love of Israel and the Jewish people was born. Howard grew up in a ZOA household. His mom and dad were honored by the Westchester County ZOA in the early 1980s. Howard has been the co-president of the Philadelphia chapter of ZOA, and he joined the national staff of ZOA in 2013 as the deputy director. I've been asked to keep it short. I could speak much longer about Howard, but for now I'm gonna turn the program over to Howard and he will introduce our featured speaker. Enjoy the program, everybody. Thank you, Alan. Um, happy Lagba Omer or Lagba Omer Sameach. I hope everyone understands the significance of Lagba Omer. It's the 33rd day between the holiday of Pesach and Shavuot. And it really, through tradition, apparently Rabbi Akiva, the very famous Rabbi Akiva during the Bar Kokhba revolt, thousands of his students succumbed to a plague. We have a pandemic, they had a plague. But on Lagba Omer, it ended. That should only happen to us. It apparently ended on this 33rd day, according to tradition. Um, thank you for that. Alan segued in for me, so I'm just going to review a couple of things with you. Every time that Patty and I speak about Israel, <clears throat> we say that we live in a golden age. And what do we mean by that golden age? That Am Yisrael, the people of Israel, are living free in an independent Jewish state. And think about that, because for 2,000 years, other than perhaps our parents, our grandparents, and our children, and ourselves, no generation has ever lived with the Jewish state for 2,000 years. My personal story, and Alan uh, mentioned it, so I'll just very briefly, because I think it's sort of on, on subject. As a young teen, I was, I, we, we accompanied 200 Tunisian and Moroccan refugees on a small Zim boat. It was really a small Zim boat to Haifa. We followed these folks over a period of weeks to the Mabarot. If people don't know what a Mabarot was, it was a transit camp. 
call it a refugee camp. The difference is that these refugees from Tunisia and Morocco and other North African and Middle Eastern countries, Jewish Arab refugees, so to speak, housing was being constructed for them and we saw that being built in the north, in the middle of the country, and in the south. And they were moved in out of those Marot and brought to that housing on behalf of a government who really couldn't afford it. Israel barely had the means to support itself, but they did it. Contrary to what has happened to the Palestinian Arabs who fled Israel during the 48 war, and they were left to live in squalor for over 70 years by most of the Arab countries where they're situated and can't even be citizens of those countries. So that just gives you a personal look at what Israel did with those refugees versus what happened to the Palestinian Arabs. And by the way, those who, who, who lived in Israel during those first few, few years, I cannot believe that they would have imagined, as we didn't, what Israel is today an economic and military powerhouse, the hub of medical and scientific discovery, a land of innovation, the startup nation. It's incredible compared to what I saw in the mid 50s. My job at ZOA, by the way, one of the uh, one, a job that I really cherish the most at ZOA is the leadership mission to Israel. And by the way, not only do we have a leadership mission to Israel, and I, I know that there's some alumni that are on this call, um, we also have campus missions. And there are two campus missions a year, and they're incredible missions. Those kids spend two weeks in Israel. They see things and experience things that no other students experience on any other student missions, for the most part. There may be a, an organization here or there that has something like that. But our mission, just a quick review, so you're gonna get a little bit of a sales pitch. We're based in Yushalayim for eight days. You unpack once. Most of the time, we're over the Green Line. We're in the Jordan Valley. We're in Hebron. We're in Gush Etzion, Judea, Samaria, Sterot. We go to the Gaza border. And obviously, as well, touring Yerushalayim, as well as meeting uh, government officials and other high-profile speakers. The feedback that I get from those that are on the mission is incredible because it is so unique. Even those that have been to Israel 20 times, they will give me feedback that says it was life changing. It was a trip of a lifetime. That's the kind of feedback. So if you have any questions, it'll probably be sometime mid-March in 2021. Uh, that's the plan at the moment. And if you have any questions, don't ever hesitate to email me at howard at zoa.org. Now, I'm thrilled and privileged to introduce our guest speaker this evening. Zev Orenstein, who guided us through the city of David, as many on this call will remember, and his expertise and explanations were amazing. Zev is the Director of International Affairs for the City of David Foundation, where he is responsible for strengthening awareness of and support of the City of David, the place where Jerusalem began and the historic site of biblical Jerusalem. He is among those shaping public policy and opinion. To that end, Zev works closely with government officials, faith leaders, NGOs, and members of the media. Zev moved to Israel in 2003 and today lives with his family in Male Adumim, Israel. Zev, I transfer this Zoom call to you. It's all yours. Thank you, Howard, Alan, Natalie, and everyone at ZOA for making this possible. And um, the, the trip that, that you spoke of, the mission, uh, it's hard to believe it was just a couple of months ago, but uh, a bit of a different world. And, and I can say I miss, I miss you all. Uh, I miss having groups like yours at the City of David and I'm looking forward to uh, March 2021 uh, to hosting you again, God willing, in the City of David. Now, uh, 
by us uh, here in, in Israel, it's, it's uh, a bit after two in the morning, so it's no longer Lag Omer. but there was something very, very special that happened in Israel on Lag Omer that I want to share with you, which is directly connected to what we're going to speak about today. So let me show you something that was found uh, and announced today in honor of Lag Omer. You should all be able to see this, my screen that is being shared on your screen. So we have a coin that was discovered uh, just next to the Temple Mount, the biblical Mount Moriah. This coin is from the Bar Kochba revolt, of course, with its, with its associations uh, to Lagba Omer, Bar Kochba. Uh, he led a revolt against the Roman occupation of Judea uh, from 132 to 135 of the Common Era. And this coin has on it, in Hebrew, an ancient Hebrew writing on one side, year two for the freedom of Israel, and perhaps even more importantly, on the other side of the coin, in Hebrew, the word Yerushalayim, Jerusalem. A coin from nearly 2,000 years ago that connected to Lagba Omer today, uh, highlighting the Jewish connection to Jerusalem going back thousands of years. Now, to no one on this call, I imagine this is uh, groundbreaking. We all know that the Jewish people have been in, in Jerusalem for far more than 2,000 years, but it makes it all the more uh, interesting or ironic when you see things like this. Uh, if you've heard of the uh, Women's March, uh, some of the uh, illustrious leaders uh, of the Women's March, like Tamika Mallory and Linda Sarsour, uh, very good friends of Israel, as I'm sure you all know. So how do they view Israel? They say, well, you needed a place, that's great, but don't throw the natives out. As if Israel is some type of colonial project that the Jews are foreigners in Israel, in Jerusalem, we're occupiers, we're colonizers. That is the way that people like those at the Women's March view Israel. And not only the Women's March, because uh, not long ago, UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, has passed over the last few years a series of resolutions talking about the significance of Jerusalem. Now, this makes sense because UNESCO is a body who has one job. Its mandate is to preserve the cultural heritage of humanity. And of course, Jerusalem has a lot of that. But according to these resolutions, Jerusalem is not actually significant to anyone who is on this call right now. Jerusalem is only significant to one group of people, uh, and that group is Islam. Uh, not significant to Jews, not significant to Christians. Uh, the resolution goes on to say that the Temple Mount, the Western Wall, are exclusively Islamic holy place, places, uh, Islamic heritage sites, and they go on to condemn the archaeological excavations in Jerusalem. And it's strange. Why would the United Nations condemn the archaeological excavations in a place like City of David? You would think that they would celebrate archaeological excavations. You would think that they would celebrate scientific discovery, affirming the heritage of one of the most significant cities in the world that has influenced billions of people uh, throughout millennia. Uh, but that is sadly not the case. And we'll talk a little bit in, in a few moments why that's not the case. But it's not only the United Nations, because if one uh, visits the Temple Mount today, they may receive a booklet uh, from the Muslim walk, the religious trust uh, that oversees the Temple Mount from the Muslim side. And you have a booklet that's called Al-Aqsa Mosque Clarifications for Misconceptions. They want to make sure that visitors to the Temple Mount, they're informed of the history of the Temple Mount. And so in this booklet, you see uh, what it says here. Uh, it's the Dome of the Rock and not the Holy of Holies. It goes on to say, uh, speak of the Al-Burak Wall and not the Wailing Wall. And of course, the Al-Aqsa Mosque and not the temple. According to the Islamic trust, there is no Jewish heritage on the Temple Mount. There was never a temple on the Temple Mount. The Wailing Wall, the Western Wall, has no significance to the Jewish people. The only significance that that wall has is that's where, according to Islam, Muhammad tied up his noble steed before ascending to heaven. There is no Jewish heritage in Jerusalem. Now, it's all the more ironic because not long ago, in 1930, this same body, the Supreme Muslim Council, put out another booklet. It's the Brief Guide to the Al-Haram al-Sharif, referring to the Temple Mount. And what does the Supreme Muslim Council in 1930 have to say about the Temple Mount? And before I show you that, why are they putting out a booklet in English? Now, the answer is very simple. In 1930, the British are in the country. And so this was a guidebook 
for British personnel stationed in the country for them to understand the significance of the Temple Mount. So what does the Supreme Muslim Council say about the Temple Mount in 1930? Well, you can see in the highlighted portion over here, its identity with the site of Solomon's Temple is beyond dispute. This too is the spot according to the universal belief on which, quote, David built an altar unto the Lord and offered birth offerings and peace offerings. They're quoting, of course, from the Bible, from the second book of Samuel. So you have, according to the Supreme Muslim Council in 1930, there was a David, there was a Solomon, there was a temple. This is universal belief beyond dispute. And as a proof text, they quote the Bible. A lot has changed over the last century. What's gone from being beyond dispute is today, according to the Palestinian leadership, according to the United Nations, is beyond existence. It no longer existent, existed. It never happened. The Jewish connection to Jerusalem uh, is uh, denied. So how can we push back against that? And in order to do that, I want to share with you what's happening in the city of David today. So for those of you who maybe have not yet been to Israel or have not yet been to the city of David, just to give a very quick overview. So when we talk about Jerusalem and the places that make Jerusalem, Jerusalem, religiously and historically, certainly for Jews and for Christians, we're talking about this one square mile area over here known as the Holy Basin. At the center of the picture over here, you could see the Temple Mount. This is the biblical Mount Moriah. This is the spot where, according to the biblical tradition in the book of Genesis, or Sefer Breshit, the story of Akedat Yitzchak, the binding of Isaac, takes place. This is the spot where King David's son Solomon will build the temple, which is why it's known as Temple Mount. That temple stands for over four centuries, destroyed by the Babylonians, rebuilt a few decades later, and destroyed by the Romans in the year 70. Over here, you could see the Western Wall, right? The famous Western Wall. Here's the old city of Jerusalem. Over here on the right side of the picture, you can see the Mount of Olives. And just below the Temple Mount, you can see the city of David. So here you have the city of David just south of the Temple Mount. Now, up until 150 years ago, when people think, where is the original biblical city of Jerusalem? The city of King David and King Solomon, prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, there is one answer, and the answer is not the city of David. Everyone believes that the original biblical city of Jerusalem is inside the walls of the old city. Until 1867, when Queen Victoria of England sends a man by the name of Captain Charles Warren to the Promised Land, to the land of Israel, to find the treasures of the Bible, like the Ark of the Covenant. Charles Warren comes to Jerusalem. He wants to excavate the Temple Mount. The Ottomans are here at that time, and they don't let him dig on the Temple Mount. So Charles Warren comes down from the Temple Mount, and he comes down to the area of the city of David, except at that time, this is what it looks like. There's nothing there. And he comes up with a theory saying that the original biblical city of Jerusalem is not inside the walls of the old city, but outside the walls of the old city, that it's here in the city of David. Except at the time, everyone thought he was crazy. But over the next 150 years, the 11-acre ridge known as the city of David becomes one of the most archaeologically excavated sites in the world, the most excavated site in Israel, with discoveries being made that prove beyond any doubt that the original biblical city of Jerusalem, the place where Jerusalem began, is the city of David, located just outside the walls of the old city. So now, what's being discovered in the city of David, and how is that impacting how the United Nations, the Palestinians, and others are relating to Jerusalem? Why is the city of David, perhaps more than any other place in Israel, causing them so many fits? And in order to understand that, I want to share with you a discovery that is not yet open to the public, but that is changing Jerusalem as we know it forever. And in order to share that discovery, we have to go back to the year 2004. And in 2004, at the very southern end of the city of David, you can see where my cursor is at the bottom of the screen, there's a road. And beneath that road, there is a sewage pipe. And in 2004, that sewage pipe explodes. Now, the city of David is not just another part of Jerusalem. The city of David in the heart of Jerusalem, biblical Jerusalem, when a sewage pipe bursts here, you don't only send in construction crews, you also have to send in archaeologists. So that's exactly what the municipality of Jerusalem does. 
They're repairing the sewage pipe, but they also have archaeologists overseeing the work. And as you can see here, you have bulldozers and dump trucks doing the work to repair the sewage pipe. And at a certain point, the archaeologists, they begin to hear scraping and scratching. It doesn't sound right. So they clear everyone out. And it turns out that in repairing the sewage pipe, the, the construction crews had inadvertently uncovered a set of ancient stone steps, steps going back some 2,000 years to the end of the second temple period. And the archaeologists said there's only one other set of steps in Jerusalem that look just like these. And these are the steps over here, the steps leading up to the southern ascent of the Temple Mount, the steps leading up to what we know as Sharei Chulda, the Chulda Gates, one of the primary ways that people going up to the temple 2,000 years ago would have entered. So you can see here the steps over here by the Hulda gates. These are the steps that the archaeologists were talking about. And they said these steps were identical to the steps that they discovered in 2004. And they realized that they had discovered the steps leading down to the ancient pool of Siloam, the Shiloach pool. Now, what is the Shiloach pool? So we just celebrated last month Pesach. We have Shavuot coming up uh, in another couple of weeks. And those are two of the three regalim, two of the three pilgrimage festivals, where all of Israel would have to go up to the temple, atop the Temple Mount, on pilgrimage. But of course, before one can go up to the temple, they have to purify themselves, immerse themselves in a mikvah, or a ritual bath. Now, the historian Josephus says 2,000 years ago that you would have had nearly 3 million people going on pilgrimage up to the temple on the Temple Mount. It's a lot of people. The pool of Siloam, the Shiloh pool in the city of David is the size of two Olympic-sized swimming pools. Why so big? In order to accommodate the thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who are purifying themselves in the pool of Siloam, in the Shiloh pool, before ascending up to the temple on pilgrimage. Which led the archaeologists to a question. If we know where the Pool of Siloam is at the very southern end of the city of David, and we know where the temple, the Beit HaMikdash, where the temple stood on the Temple Mount, how did everyone get from the pool all the way up to the temple? And so the archeologists widened the excavation. And what I'm going to show you now is what I had the pleasure and privilege of sharing with the ZOA mission uh, just a couple of months ago. Again, something that's not open to the public, but it's something that I wanna share with everyone at ZOA. Uh, share it with you virtually now, and God willing, when you uh, come on ZOA's next trip, uh, to God willing, be able to share it with you in person as well. And that is the discovery of the pilgrimage road. This is the road that our ancestors, the ancestors of everyone on this call, yours and mine, this is the road that they walked on when they went on pilgrimage up to the temple on the Temple Mount. Not a road that looks like this, not stones that look like these. This is the actual pilgrimage road with the original flagstones. Now the road itself today, you can see all the arches and the engineering support. The road today is about 60 feet beneath the surface. You have the modern day city of David above, the modern homes, the road, the cars, all that's above. This is 60 feet down below. Now the pilgrimage road itself is about five times wider than what you can see over here. It, it would have been very, very wide to accommodate all the people going down to the pool to purify, all the people going up uh, towards the temple. So what the archeologists are doing right now is a north-south excavation to connect the Shiloh pool with the footsteps of the Temple Mount the Western Wall, the Hulda Gates. That is what's happening right now. God willing, in the next three to four years or so, we'll be able to complete that connection, at which time uh, the archeologists will then do an east-west expansion to uncover the full length of the road. Now this will always be underground. The modern neighborhood of the city of David is going to uh, be up above, and this will be down below. Now along the road, archeologists find something very unique. But before I share that with you, when you're in the place where the Bible happened, the words of the Bible come to life. And I want to give you a very relevant example as we're looking at this image of the pilgrimage road. In Tehillim, in the Psalms, there are 14 chapters of the Psalms from 120 through 134, which are known as the Songs of Ascent. 
or Shira Ma'alot, right? Attributed to King David, these songs of ascent are among the most special and well-known chapters of the Psalms. Now, when we think of the songs of ascent, we're thinking of perhaps a spiritual ascent. You're going up to Jerusalem, you're going up to the temple, it's a very holy experience, but it means more than that. Because when were these songs of ascent being sung? They were being sung by our ancestors on their way up along the pilgrimage road, up to the temple on the Temple Mount. When you're coming up from the Shiloh pool, going up a half mile journey, all the way up to the Temple Mount, you're physically going uphill. Or as we would say, probably I imagine many of you are familiar with the word, it's a schlep, right? So as you're schlepping up the hill, from the Shiloh pool, that half mile up to the Beit HaMikdash, up to the temple on the Temple Mount, you're singing those songs of ascent. When you're in the place where the Bible happened, the words of the Bible come to life. Now, in that spirit, along the pilgrimage road, archaeologists discover this structure. It's the only one of its kind found in Jerusalem, and it's found along the pilgrimage road. Now, what is this? This is a podium, an ancient 2,000-year-old podium. And imagine that you would have had 2,000 years ago, obviously this is before you have TV or, or billboards or anything like that. Imagine somebody had a message that they wanted to broadcast to the masses, a political message, a religious message, an ethical message that they wanted to share. Well, where are you going to do it? You're going to go to where the people are. There is perhaps no place in Jerusalem, where you would find more people during the pilgrimage festivals than along the pilgrimage road in the city of David. So you can imagine someone getting up on this podium 2,000 years ago and sharing whatever message they had to share. And if they were interesting, people would stop and listen. And if not, someone else would get up and give it a go. But this was the beating heart of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. As I like to call it, this is the biblical superhighway. Now, this past June, June 30th of this past year, there was a very special event in the city of David. We were celebrating the breakthrough of the lower half of the pilgrimage road from the Shiloh pool, the pool of Siloam, all the way up to the point where you could see over here, the midpoint of the pilgrimage road. And in order to mark this occasion, we had many dignitaries from Israel uh, and throughout the country but also the Trump administration sent a delegation of 12 senior officials to participate in this special ceremony. And the question that I've been asked more than any other was why was it that the United States sent such a prestigious delegation, led of course by the United States' ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, who there are no words that I can say that would do justice to to the man and what he's done for, for Israel and for America and for the, the US-Israel alliance. But it would have made sense if the United States would have said, okay, we have a special relationship with Israel. And so out of respect for that relationship, we're going to send Ambassador Friedman to this event. But they did more than that. They sent nearly a dozen officials. And the question is why? And I think there's a very simple answer for why the United States sent such a prestigious delegation to mark the breakthrough of the pilgrimage road in the city of David. And that's because the United States understands, this administration understands that the foundations that America is built upon, those values come from Jerusalem. The founding fathers understood that America was built on what they knew as the Judeo-Christian heritage. The, those values of freedom, liberty, and justice, which have their roots in Jerusalem and in the pages of the Bible. And therefore, the city of David is not just a Jewish heritage site. It's not just a site with significance to Israel, but it's also an American heritage site. It's like Gettysburg, Valley Forge, Plymouth Rock, just 6,000 miles away. And therefore, when someone denies the heritage of Jerusalem, whether it's the Palestinian Authority, whether it's the United Nations and UNESCO, they're not only denying the heritage of the Jewish people and of Israel in Jerusalem, they're also denying the heritage of America and the American people whose very identity and foundations are rooted in Jerusalem, in the city of David. And that's why 
this administration sent such a prestigious delegation to take part in this ceremony because they understand what the pilgrimage road represents, not only to the Jewish people, but also to America. And which is why at the conclusion of this celebration, there was an official dinner in the United States Embassy in Jerusalem hosted by Ambassador Friedman and all the members of the delegation. Now, we've also been privileged to host some other very important people along the pilgrimage road, which you can see over here. Uh, again, this is from the recent visit of the ZOA delegation to the city of David along the pilgrimage road here. Uh, you can see uh, that we had uh, a very special time. This is just outside the pilgrimage road. So here you can see the modern neighborhood uh, of the city of David and the pilgrimage road is literally just some 60 feet down beneath our feet. Now, when one thinks of the wonders of the world, you think of places like the pyramids in Egypt, you think of the Colosseum in Rome, and I will and I argue, I will argue that the pilgrimage road in the city of David, city of David not David. only belongs in that same conversation, but I believe it even stands in a category all its own. And I'll tell you why. If you visit the pyramids, you can go there today and say, wow, look at that engineering. It's so impressive what people could build 4,000 years ago. Uh, we probably built it, so, so we did a good job. But okay, great. But where is that Egyptian civilization today? Well, the Egypt of today is not the Egypt of 4,000 years ago. The Egypt of today can be found in museums. Now you go to Rome, you go to see the Colosseum, and you look at that structure, say, wow, look at what people built 2,000 years ago. Impressive. And again, where's the great Roman Empire today? They don't exist, right? You can go to museums. And now you come to the pilgrimage road in the city of David. And here we have a very different story because here, when you come to the pilgrimage road, what does it represent? This is not a piece of history, but it's a continuation of a story. It's not that once upon a time there was a place called Jerusalem, once upon a time there were these people called Jews and, and they had all these strange customs. The people that walked on this pilgrimage road in the city of David 2000 years ago are the same people who walked on it when the ZOA visited, and it's the same people who are going to walk on it, God willing, in a couple of years when it's opened up to the public. It's the same people with the same faith, the same holidays, worshiping the same God, the same customs and traditions and festivals. And where do you find something like that today anywhere else? And the answer is, you don't. So what does the United Nations have to say about all this? What does the Palestinian leadership have to say about all this? It's very simple. They say it's fake. Now, I understand why they say it's fake, because what else are they going to say? Because the story that they have built their whole narrative on is that Israel is a colonial project, that Jews have no ties to Jerusalem. We've never been here before. And therefore, we need to not be here now. We need to make this Palestine. And therefore, when a discovery like this is made, and the magnitude of this discovery comes out, what are they going to say? The emperor is naked. The story that they've been telling, that Jews have no heritage in Jerusalem, is being laid bare for the world to see for the lie that it is. And that's why the completion of this excavation is so important, because it will enable millions upon millions of people every year from all faiths and backgrounds from all over the world to see with their own eyes, to touch with their own hands, to walk with their own feet, literally in the footsteps of the Bible. It's real, you could see it, you could touch it. And when you talk about discoveries that you could see and you could touch, so there's something else that uh, I would be remiss if I didn't share with you today. And that is the Romans, were so proud when they destroyed Jerusalem in the year 70 that you could see over here, they mint a coin. After all the Roman victories, they would mint coins to commemorate their conquest. And on this coin, here's the Roman Emperor Vespasian. And you can see on this coin, it says Judea Capta. Judea has been captured or defeated. The name of the country at that time was Judea with the capital of Jerusalem. And you could see a Roman legionnaire towering above a Jewish woman on her knees crying. This was the most widely minted Roman victory coin ever minted. Here you have in Rome, the Arch of Titus. Now Titus will later become emperor of Rome, but before he's emperor of Rome, he's the commander of the 10th Roman legion, which destroys Jerusalem. 
on the arch itself, you can see the temple treasures being led out of Jerusalem and into Rome. You could see how proud the Romans were over the destruction of Jerusalem. And yet, in the years leading up to that destruction, from 66 to 70, the Jews launched what's known as the Great Revolt, the Great Jewish Revolt for Freedom against the Roman occupation of Jerusalem. And each year of that revolt, the Jews are minting these small bronze coins, and scholars have wondered why. Now, before I tell you a little bit more about this coin, I want to show you where we found a coin just like that in the city of David. Take a look over here. Along the pilgrimage road, you could see right over here an identical coin to that one. This coin was melted in the fires that destroyed Jerusalem onto the flagstones of the pilgrimage road. And I have over here in my hand an identical coin to that one. You could see right over here, this is a coin dating back to the year 67. And on this coin, it says in ancient Hebrew writing, Lecherut Zion, for the freedom of Zion. Zion, of course, being another name for Jerusalem. So why were the Jews at that time minting these coins if at that time the coins from a currency perspective were worthless? And if they wanted to fight the Romans, why did they not use the metal to make weapons instead of minting a worthless currency? So I want to share with you an answer that I heard to this question. And that is, the Jews of Jerusalem understood that the Romans were likely going to destroy the city. But they also believed that one day in the future, their descendants would return and they would restore sovereignty in Jerusalem. Now, they probably thought it would take a few decades, maybe a century. They couldn't imagine it would be nearly 2,000 years before their descendants would return as sovereign. But eventually we did. And here we are in Jerusalem today, the capital of the Jewish state of Israel. And it gives us a little perspective that you go back to the time when this coin was minted. It was not one of the high points of Jerusalem. But as we've been saying uh, here in Israel, when we celebrated Passover under lockdown, we said, we survived Pharaoh. We'll get through this too. We got through the Romans. We got through a lot of other uh, challenging times. We'll get through this challenging time as well. And I want to end with two last discoveries and then open up for questions. Uh, and these discoveries are, are very, very dear to me on a personal level. So we have over here, some of you may recognize this. This is a stone dating back some 2,000 years. It's found today by Robinson's Arch, uh, the very uh, southern end of the Western Wall. This stone was cast off by the Romans in the year 70 when they destroyed the temple. And if you look closely, you could see on this stone, you could see it has writing on it, Hebrew writing. And what it says on this stone is Lebet Hatkia, to the trumpeter's house. Now, if anyone has celebrated Shabbat in Jerusalem, you know that shortly before Shabbat comes in, there is a siren telling everyone that Shabbat's about to start. Where do they get this custom from? Both the Gemara in Shabbat and also Josephus talk about how in Jerusalem, thousands of years ago, there was a siren or a trumpet that was blown from the temple to tell all the shopkeepers and shoppers to get ready to accept the, the, the Sabbath. Now, that's interesting enough on its own. But a couple of years ago, I took my oldest daughter, Hodea. She's now almost 16. So this is from a few years ago. And I took her on a tour of the city of David. And we came to this stone. And I asked my daughter if she could read what was written on the stone. And she said, Abba, Dad, it says, Le Beit Kia. Now, I was very proud of my daughter. Thank God she could read. But I was proud for another reason. How many people can go back more than 2,000 years and read the writing of their ancestors? The answer is very few. My daughter could do that because it shows the reason we're here in Jerusalem is not because of the Holocaust, not because of anti-Semitism or persecution, but it's because this is where we've been for thousands of years. And I need to give uh, a little bit of face time to my other daughter, uh, and I'll do that in a moment. A seal was discovered in the city of David. This is a couple of years ago. And on this seal is a name. This seal dates back 2,500 years, found in the city of David. And it says, Eliana Bat Gael, Eliana, the daughter of Gael. Now, this seal made it to the New York Times and other international media. And why was this seal so important? Well, interestingly enough, normally for a seal to get that type of media coverage, you have to have a name from the Bible on it. And this seal does not have a name from the Bible. But what this seal does have is the unique ability to say that it's one of about five seals going back two and a half thousand years ago in Jerusalem that belonged to a woman. 
So we don't know who this woman was, but we do know that she was someone important, maybe a member of the royal family, maybe a cultural leader, a business leader, a spiritual leader of some kind, but she was a woman of stature, an Eshet Chayil. Now, what does that have to do with my other daughter, Eliana? Well, when this seal was found, I went home and I told my daughter, we found a seal today with your name on it. And she was excited, obviously. But I said to her, don't just be excited about the fact that you share the, a name with this person. You have so much more in common with her. She asked me what? And I said again, you're both Jewish. You're both from Jerusalem. You worship the same God, celebrate the same Chagim, the same festivals. You speak the same language. And how many people can go back more than two and a half thousand years and say that they have all those things in common with their ancestors. So no, we're not colonizers, we're not occupiers, we're not foreigners. You will not find on this planet another people that has as much connection and history and heritage shared with one place than the Jewish people have with the land of Israel in general and with Jerusalem in particular. And that's not simply as a matter of faith, but as a matter of fact. And on that note, I am happy to open this up for questions. And thank you for allowing me to share this with you. So, Ave, that was absolutely incredible. And by the way, everyone should recognize that it isn't, uh, it isn't 743 Eastern time where Ave is speaking from, but in fact, 243 in the, in the middle of the morning in the middle of the night and we thank you for that and that's really we we really really appreciate your your doing that i i have a question that's rather intriguing um what jerusalem fact that you explain to tourists and visitors do they find the most surprising i'll share an answer with you uh, I don't know if it's an answer that everyone here will, will be excited about in terms of this audience, but I can tell you when, uh, in 2019, we hosted perhaps 20% of Congress uh, in the city of David. We had, I think, six or seven cabinet officials. When we talk about the pilgrimage road in the city of David, it's stretching from the Pool of Siloam all the way up through the city of David to the footsteps of the Temple Mount, from a Christian perspective, it is a place with deep, deep significance. Uh, according to, to the Christians, the Pool of Siloam has, has a unique significance to Christianity. Uh, from a historical perspective, uh, I've been asked if Jesus would have been here. And again, from a historical perspective, I say to them, if you believe that there was a Jesus 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, he was almost certainly Jewish. And therefore, he would have been doing all the same things that Jews would have done 2,000 years ago, going to the Pool of Siloam, immersing himself and then going up along the pilgrimage road to the temple on the temple mount and there are not many places where you could say from a historic perspective that jesus was there and so you have in the city of david the pool of siloam the pilgrimage road going all the way up to the temple mount that's exciting for for many 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 people and you know i say to them you will not find another place in the world with more significance, and not just another place, a half mile. You will not find a half mile stretch in the world with more significance to more people than you will find in the city of David in the half mile running from the Pool of Siloam all the way up through the city of David along the pilgrimage road to the Temple Mount. There is not a half mile exists that anywhere else on the planet with more significance to more people than that stretch in the city of David. And I think when people see that, and hear that and get to experience that, it's a life-changing uh, experience for them. And, and I'm, I'm saying this not just about faith leaders, I'm talking about members of Congress, administration officials, you see that they're moved. There's a reason why they're coming to the city of David and it's not just uh, to strengthen their pro-Israel credentials, but it's a place that, that really touches the core identity uh, of who they are, uh, both as Christians and as Americans. And it's something that's uh, very special to, to see. Thank you. That, uh, you've answered two questions there that were asked already in terms of what the Christian um, reaction will be. And I suspect you're going to have millions of visitors to the Pilgrimage Road when it finally opens. Those that want to ask a question 
um, and haven't uh, put it on the chat can certainly raise their hands right now and we'll recognize you. Um, another question, this is, Abbas denies the authenticity of the pilgrimage road. Now this may be political and you may not want to answer that. How can he possibly deny the authenticity of the Roman stones? What possible explanation can there be? So uh, I'll broaden the question a little bit. How could the United Nations deny it? How could you have a body like UNESCO uh, denying the heritage of Jerusalem? Why would anyone believe this? And I think the answer is twofold. Number one, everyone on this call, I'm sure, when it comes to the issue of Israel and Jerusalem are experts. But if we were to start having a conversation about, I don't know, the Congo or the Netherlands or somewhere else, I'm guessing most people here probably would not be uh, extraordinarily knowledgeable. And so we assume that what's obvious to us is obvious to everyone else. And I think that oftentimes it's an assumption that is misplaced. Uh, the average person uh, is not necessarily uh, an expert on the history of Israel or even today in the history of the Bible. And we shouldn't assume that what we take for granted uh, that they have that knowledge. Uh, but I think there's also uh, another answer, which is I have had the, let's call it privilege, uh, of hosting in the city of David dozens and dozens of United Nations ambassadors, UNESCO ambassadors, and I've taken them to the pilgrimage road and, and walked through the city of David with them, sharing with them all these different discoveries. And not a single one of them has ever stopped me in the middle of the tour or said afterwards, Zev, you're telling us lies. This is not true. We know that Jews and Christians were never here. Stop lying to us. It has not happened. And in fact, the opposite, they've been visibly moved. So then what's going on? How are these resolutions being passed? And the answer is very simple. In the United Nations today, uh, there are, I believe, 50, 52 Muslim countries. And there are a grand total of one Jewish country, Israel. That's it. So by numbers alone, we're already not in a great, great shape. And then you have all sorts of countries, whether for economic reasons, political reasons, or other reasons, uh, they side when it comes to votes with the Islamic countries. Uh, and therefore, Israel is not going to get a, a fair shake when it comes to the United Nations. And to give one case in point, in 2016, when, this fir when the first UNESCO resolution about Jerusalem denying its heritage was passed, there was United, UNESCO's, uh, Mexico's ambassador to UNESCO. Uh, he went to his uh, foreign office and said before the vote, well, what are my instructions? How do you want me to vote? And they said, well, we're gonna support the resolution. Now, Mexico, it's a very Christian, it's a Catholic country. He says, what do you mean we're going to support the resolution? It's not true. And they said, no, no, you're going to vote in favor of the resolution. And again, he said, it's not true. And they said, you're going to support the resolution. And when the resolution came up for a vote, what happened? He did not follow his instructions. And you know what he was doing the next day? He was looking for a job. And his fellow ambassadors saw that and they said, you know what? We like being ambassadors. We like living in New York City in a nice apartment with all the perks that go along with being an ambassador. We're not gonna fall on our sword to debate what happened in Jerusalem thousands of years ago. And so the short answer is it's politics. Uh, you have, um, if you're all, I'm sure familiar with Goebbels, Joseph Goebbels uh, going back to the Holocaust and the big lie theory. And the idea being, if you repeat a lie often enough, and it's a big enough lie, people will start to believe it. And I think it's, it's also, the reason they're doing it also is, is a very simple reason. Uh, people like Abbas and others are denying that Jews have any heritage in Jerusalem. Now, what's the problem with that? Every day in a place like the city of David, antiquities are being unearthed, which show the connection of the Jewish people to Jerusalem going back thousands of years, not simply as a matter of faith, but as a matter of fact. Now, what are you going to do with that? You, you, you can't contend, they can't contend with the science, with the archaeology. So what do they do? They go to the United Nations where they have a guaranteed majority and they pass resolutions rewriting Jerusalem's history, getting the headlines in the media denying Jerusalem's history. And that is the way that they're trying to push back against the incredible amount of archaeological discovery, which is showing every day that the Jewish people have been in Jerusalem for thousands of years. Thank you. 
Um, there's a, someone who's raised their hand. It comes under Enid Roman, but I don't think it's Enid Roman. Can, can we um, access that and unmute that caller before I get to another chat uh, question? Hello? Whoever yes, raised You're hand. unmuted now. Ask your question, please. Nobody there? Um, Zave? Mm -hmm. um, another question from a colleague. Can you explain and debunk the notion of an, in quotes, East Jerusalem? We refer to it as Eastern Jerusalem, but can you debunk the notion of an East Jerusalem Absolutely. based on what's going on in Ir David, in the city of David? Absolutely. So what, what's funny first about the term East Jerusalem is that it actually encompasses not only the eastern portion of Jerusalem, but also the northern portion of Jerusalem and the southern Jerusalem. So East Jerusalem is a, is a, a misnomer in, in every possible way. Now, when one thinks of the sites that make Jerusalem, Jerusalem significant to Christians and Jews, your, whether the Western Wall, the Temple Mount, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the Garden of Gethsemane, the Mount of Olives, the City of David, every single one of those sites is in what the world refers to as East Jerusalem. Now, why does that matter? Well, it matters for a very important reason. If we take, for instance, Bethlehem, the Church of the Nativity, in the early 2000s, the Church of the Nativity was taken over by Palestinian terrorists. If you look uh, throughout the region, what ISIS was doing, destroying holy places uh, to Christians as well as to Jews throughout the region. If you look at what the Islamic Waqf did on the Temple Mount in the late 90s, where they removed 400 truckloads of earth from the Temple Mount, rich with antiquities that link directly to the period, both of the first Temple period and the second Temple period on the Temple Mount. Uh, we know from 1948 to 1967, when the Jordanians illegally occupied Jerusalem, that they blew up every synagogue in the old city. There was no access to the Western Wall. They desecrated and destroyed tens of thousands of graves on the Mount of Olives. When I meet with members of Congress, I say to them, if you value Jerusalem as a place that is open, free, and accessible to people of all faiths and backgrounds, including the Jewish people, but not only the Jewish people, if that is something that is important to you, the only time in virtually the last 2,000 years that that has been the case has been the last 50 plus years that Jerusalem has been under Israeli sovereignty. I said, if you want to be able to ensure that one day your grandchildren will be able to visit not only the city of David, but also the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the Garden of the Gethsemane and the Mount of Olives, the only way that you know with certainty that that will be possible is if all of Jerusalem remains under Israeli sovereignty. And again, without getting into politics, but, but that is something that uh, this administration uh, has recognized in their policy towards Jerusalem, both in terms of uh, relocating its embassy to Jerusalem and in terms of uh, its vision for the future, which calls on all of Jerusalem to remain sovereign under Israeli rule. Zev, question. Um, obviously, we know where the pilgrimage road begins at the Shiloh pool. Do the archaeologists know, and is there any possibility they can go under the road and through that Davidson area to the southern steps? Because obviously it had to lead to those southern steps, which are, were reproduced down at the pool. So the short answer without getting overly technical is, God willing, in the next three to four years, uh, visitors to the city of David will be able to start at the Pool of Siloam and walk all the way up along the pilgrimage road and come out at the southern steps at Robinson's Arch. Uh, it, it will happen. We don't need to get into the, the engineering uh, way it's going to happen, but, but it'll happen. Well, I, I can honestly say that it's when you're in the pilgrimage road now, it is the most incredible sight. You, you didn't explain those bags of earth right. that keep moving up on conveyor belts. Uh, it was moving while we were walking on that, on that road. It's a very um, active excavation. Yep. Um, this is a little bit of a, a tough question. I'm not sure I really, what is the attitude of Israelis as you read them to building a third temple? If you don't wish to answer that, we understand. I'll give you a very, a very um, good way to understand what Israelis want. Uh, we have had 
uh, three elections, almost four, in the last year and change. If you want to get a sense of what uh, is most Israelis are thinking about, look at uh, what the parties are running on. Uh, I could tell you that if there was uh, more than 4%, which is basically what you need to get into the Knesset uh, and, and cross the electoral threshold, if you had more than 4% uh, of the Israeli electorate that strongly believed in the idea of, of building a temple, you would have a political party running on that platform. And uh, I guess I'll leave, leave it at that for now. Okay, if there's anyone else who would like to ask, Roz Barron. Roz Barron yes. actually met you and she is a, a wonderful alumnus, along with Al Lindemann that I see on the, on the photos here. But hi, Roz, go ahead. Hi, Howard, thank you so much. Zave, it was a great pleasure, magnificent presentation. I enjoyed it in Jerusalem in the city of David and I enjoy it tonight. I have a question which may not have an answer. That area with the stones where we sat, where you said that that's probably where people stood up and spoke to all the people coming up from the pool going to the Beit HaMikdash. Do you think the prophet stood there and spoke to the people? So uh, I'll give you a, a technical answer, which, which is no. Uh, only, but, but it's a technical answer because that actual podium dates back 2,000 years. The pilgrimage road that we walked on dates back 2,000 years to the very end of the Second Temple period. When we speak of the Tanakh, the Bible, that ends almost 400 years before that time. So there would have almost certainly been an earlier version of the pilgrimage road. This pilgrimage road goes back to the late Second Temple period. So there would have been something earlier than that, and probably a podium similar to that one. But if we're talking about that specific podium that, that you all got to stand on, that would not have been around. Uh, that, that's definitely after the period of the prophets. You actually answered another question. What road would have been used from the pool if it was that pool at, in, during the first temple period from the city of David, 2,500? BCE basic, uh, sorry, 2,500 years ago. Yeah. Um, and so you've basically answered that question. There is probably a road. It may have been covered over by right. the Roman road. Yeah. So uh, are there any other questions? Uh, Mike Goodman. Yes, hello. Um, I was just curious, since you mentioned the problem of the broken a sewer pipe. Uh, isn't it true that uh, the basic infrastructure in uh, the formerly Jordanian occupied part of Jerusalem, all of that had to be completely uh, overhauled because of the totally primitive state of the uh, infrastructure in that part of the city? Thanks. So the short answer is, is obviously since 1967, Israel has done a lot of infrastructure work uh, throughout Jerusalem. Uh, that said, even in, I'm sure, New York and other parts of the United States, infrastructure goes. Uh, sewage pipes don't only burst in Jerusalem, they burst uh, in other parts of the world also. And uh, in 2004, it was a particularly uh, cold winter. We had a number of snowstorms and rainstorms and the pipe burst. And we have, a, a in our tradition, it says, Harbesh luchim lemakom, God has many messengers. And in this case, the messenger that brought about the discovery of the Shiloh pool and the pilgrimage road was a broken sewage pipe. So in the grand scheme of things, it's pretty good that uh, the pipe did not hold up. Zave, it's been a privilege. You are, you are chazak, chazak, and please continue what you're doing for Am Yisrael, for Eretz Yisrael, and for all of us who support the Jewish state. Um, Thank you. And, and it is now three o'clock in the morning, your time. Yes, exactly three o'clock. We release you. I don't release everyone on this phone call, but we absolutely release you. Thank you so much for and, and what I you've wish done. All of you to keep up the great work as well. Thank you. Bishana Haba'a. Bishana Habab Yerushalayim. Amen. 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 All right. Take absolutely. care, everyone. Folks, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for for tuning in uh, on this Zoom event. Obviously, you've listened to many others as well. Uh, ZOA is doing amazing work.
whether it be on campus, whether by the, our law and justice department, whether it be on all of our events, whether it be on these Zoom calls. This is a time when I call out to all of you to continue to support, support COA, please support us because all of this doesn't come for nothing. No one else will put it in those mundane terminology, but we need your help. And I personally reach out to you to help us during this entire and difficult period. And hopefully we will see an end just like we did with Rabbi Akiva's students. And this pandemic will end soon and we'll get to open and hopefully a sense of normalcy will return. I have to call your attention to three other Zoom events tomorrow, Wednesday, May 13th at 1 p.m., the ZOA Book Club meeting with ZOA Director of Pro uh, Special Projects, Liz Burney, fe featuring renowned author Robert Spencer, The Palestinian Delusion, The Catastrophic History of the Middle East Peace Process. Thursday evening, May 14th, 7 p.m., Israel's Unity Government, an in-depth analysis of Israel's most pressing issues hosted by ZOA Michigan Executive Director Kobe Erez. And Monday evening, May 18th, 7 p.m., an inside look at ZOA's work on Capitol Hill, educating Congress on the truth about the Arab-Islamic war against Israel and other matters affecting all of us, all Jews, featuring ZOA Director of Government Relations, Dan Pollock, interviewed by our incredible Z director, ZOA Director of Outreach and Engagement, Alan Jay, who has really been our host as well. We thank you all for attending. We'll see you soon tomorrow or Thursday or Monday. Be well, stay safe, stay healthy, and good night.